Hello again. I'm still playing absolutely ridiculous amounts of RimWorld and having a lot of fun. I've got loads of ideas to get through, but this video is about dwarves. I downloaded a modded xenotype called the Stoneborn. Dwarves, basically. Stout, abrasive little bearded folk that are very good at mining, building and crafting. Obviously there's a bit more to them than just that, but you get the idea. They're dwarves. So what do dwarves do? Well, they make fortresses of course, and that's what I want to do. I made a scenario to start with five dwarves, set the storyteller to Randy on Strive to Survive, and made a very predictable tunneler ideology named Way of Stone, before landing in a crater providing plenty of earth to strike. I started with some of the deeper technologies and five colonists, just so that I wouldn't have to say this playthrough will start out slow again like I always do. Hi laddie, we're dwarves! We know how to do some fabricating, don't we? Well that was kind of cringe, but anyway, the dwarves in question are a solid bunch. Sam, Trudy, Bucky, Caldwell and Chef. Thanks to the Xenotype, they're all great at mining, building and crafting of course. None of them are particularly combat focused, and Chef rather predictably can cook, while Bucky is good at growing and researching. Other than that, there's not much else to say. So immediately into the rock face they go, making a few small initial rooms to hold beds, shelves and basic cooking facilities before delving deeper to where the eventual main hallway of the base will actually be. This initial space will hopefully soon be turned into a kill box. I don't really want to subject these guys to any combat, automated defences can handle all of that. The faction got named Mountain Folk and the colony was called the Mountain Homes, naturally. For some reason with this colony, Randy was particularly bloodthirsty. Basically all the events in the first year are raids. And I will say that I tried to balance the factions on this world to make for generally higher tech enemies, meaning there's no Neanderthals and only a couple of kingdoms and tribes. The rest are rootin' tootin' types with guns and such. Anyway, we, we've got a shotgun, a rifle and a tunnel, so most early threats are pretty easy to deal with. The colony fought off four raids in the first hour or so of its existence whilst rushing to research geothermal generators. There's a load of vents close to the crater walls that can be pretty easily secured like this to feed stable power back into the mountain. Doing this poses some slightly annoying threats later on. Drop pod raids, meteors cutting the power, that sort of thing, but for the most part it's safe enough anyway. At one point hunters passed through the area and pissed off a gang of muffalo. Once they were done with the hunters they turned their ire to the mountain home. Thank you shotguns for being just so damn overpowered in the early game of Combat Extended. In a short reprieve from raiders, we got a dining room, kitchen combo and a couple of bedrooms built. We're almost ready to abandon the original mountain foothold, but there's still quite a lot of work to do in here. So Sam and Caldwell got married, which is convenient since they can share a room now. I built all of these bedrooms with double beds, expecting more people to share, but I always forget to change bed sharing from married to free in my ideologians. I ain't no prude, but I am forgetful, so the dwarven lovers had to abstain for as long as it took them to marry. While Randy's raiders continued to rain down on the rainy colony, I accidentally let a load of Eaterkin have an easy way into the base since they arrived while I was building another generator. They found their way into the workshop and tried to run off with some shinies, and they were summarily executed for their crimes. Next I have a go with some Toxfolk, and by this point Caldwell had got his hands on an assault rifle and Chef had found a spare shotgun amongst the corpses, so they too were vanquished despite Bucky taking a shotgun slug to his guts. The next raid was a touch more interesting, because the raiders in their haywire drop pods were dwarves. The xenotype mod also adds a faction of stoneborn, which is helpful when you're looking to make a dwarven ethnostate. A prisoner called Mister was taken and very slowly converted before being recruited. As a part of the celebration for murdering so many of their own kind, Chef and Trudy got married, and Chef wasted no time and got her pregnant pretty much immediately, presumably whilst consummating the marriage. This is fine by me. The colony has plenty of food, so it shouldn't be an issue raising a wee little babby dwarf. Speaking of consummating the marriage, thanks so much to everyone that's subscribed so far, pushing the channel over 10,000 subscribers now. As the channel keeps growing I get just a little bit more confident that I could actually do this for a living one day, so thanks just for being interested I guess. Anyway back to raids, a defoliator mech cluster landed and to be honest I didn't really feel like dealing with it. I'd have to run across a whole load of open land to take it out and figured I'd leave it to somebody else while I spent my time building lovely hydroponics basins in the hallways. As if to try and drive their point home, the mechanoids landed another defoliator in the crater right next to the first, which just made me even less likely to go out there. 
So I set up an area that just skirted the range of the turrets and restricted everybody to it for now. The first to have a go at the mechs were the piggies, who arrived intending to siege the colony but obviously wouldn't get the chance to do so. They crashed against the mechs like waves against the implacable cliffs of the coast. Mister tried to escape and took a solid bonk from Trudy's Warhammer for the troubles. See, I'm learning my lesson and not using a monosword to stop prison breaks this time. No beheadings here, just bonks. So Mister got popped back into bed just in time for a meteor to land and disrupt the colony's power. I figured that'd happen eventually, but it's not a huge deal anyway and gets fixed pretty quick. Now it's time for round two for the mechanoids. Royal tribute collectors this time, and they tried their best, but all they got for their efforts was killed. Immediately after round two comes round three as usual. Toxfolk had a crack at it and found much the same result as everybody else so far. At this point I'm researching mortars so that I can deal with them myself. As fun as it is watching everybody die to them, I'd like to be able to go back outside and have traders at some point. Another siege had a go, bandits this time. Surprise, surprise, they failed. While all this was going on outside, back in the mountain we were filling out the workshop and building a basic hospital for Trudy to do the baby thing in, because here it comes now. I considered chucking it in a growth vat till it was a child, but decided against it. Bad memories of Greg, I think. Mister was convinced to join the colony. He's pretty useful. For the most part, he'll sit and craft in the workshop. Everyone is a good crafter, but most people have other largely permanent jobs to do. Sam and Caldwell are usually mining or building. When she's not giving birth, Trudy is hauling. Bucky grows the shrooms and researches the rest of the time, and, well, Chef is a chef. A drop pod raid of Tox folk landed close enough to actually reach my defenses, which was a nice change. And at this point, the mountain can defend itself. And then another mech cluster lands. And though this one is a bit stunted and largely harmless, it does still provide a mech to go and reload the turrets of the other clusters. I did try and use a field gun to take these clusters out, but the accuracy was just too bad. I couldn't keep making shells and throwing them away like this, so I'd just wait until I either had proper artillery or something came along and dealt with them for me. But the clusters are getting quite annoying now, because I really need advanced components. And here are my knights in shining armour. Yeah, all those raids and sieges that couldn't get it done, and here's a small group of mega sloths smashing the mechanoids to bits. They left a single turret that I dealt with by creeping Trudy up to it with her hammer while it was distracted shooting at Caldwell, who only took a shot or two in the process, he's fine. And at this point the map is absolutely covered in components and ship parts due to a space battle that happened earlier, so I'll be fine for regular components, it's just advanced components that I need, I can't even build the fabrication bench yet. And look who's here! Another mech cluster! with a toxic spewer this time. But I have proper artillery now, so it won't be an issue. Wait, why aren't my shells exploding? Oh god damn it, there's a high shield! Okay, fine, we'll just wait it out. In seven days, the shield will recharge. This gives me some time to start building some factory parts with the mech components from the previous clusters. Starting with a chem fuel clarifier to help clean up some of the corpses that are going to pile up in the entrance. I accepted a rewarded combat quest too, since I knew that it would just run into the cluster. The reward was just some Eltex gear and a psychic harmonizer, which aren't useful to us at all. Dwarves are psychically deaf, you see. It was just stuff to sell. When finally the cluster's shields took a break, I got to drop some 155mm HE onto it. Unfortunately, dealing with clusters in this way does have a tendency to mash up a lot of the usual rewards, so sadly there's no mechanoid components left here. And seeing that the way was clear, some more pigs had a go. Naturally, they fell over in the main entrance. That's pretty much how raids here go. But still, I added a bit to the defences, because it can't hurt to be overprepared. The pigs were obviously annoyed by this, because they sent a siege right afterwards, which went also predictably. Just gotta get a 155mm shell close enough to draw them into an assault, and then gun them down. Since we had a kid now, I kind of portioned off half the hospital to use as a classroom. Which seems like an odd thing to do, but I mean it is what it is, it works. Given that I was using an extremely inefficient setup for my hydroponics, there were some slight power issues around this time. So I researched advanced power sources and started replacing some of the geothermals with their advanced versions. Ultimately I'm planning to go nuclear, but I'll save that for a little bit later. And I took a quest that rewarded a Persona core for taking on some manhunting elephants, which I probably should have kept, but I sold it near immediately. Oh well. 
I probably won't need one of those later. The little babby dwarf became a little child dwarf and got the nickname Tomboy. Hopefully not a bad omen of dementia and dead children. Anyway, I had a strange infestation event at this point. And you might be thinking it's strange that it took this long. Well, when I play a colony like this, sometimes I'll just remove the insect factions. Because I don't actually find their events particularly fun. I want to build a dwarf fortress and not be concerned with making it insect proof. Call me a coward in the comments, please. Engagement is good for the algorithm. So anyway, with that in mind, why has this happened? Well, I think it's because the large infestation event comes from vanilla events expanded. The insects here aren't actually hostile. They just mill around and later on I figured out that if I kill the queen, they'll just leave. It's very strange. Luring the queen out to the turrets can be a little bit dangerous, but it's usually pretty easily done. After which everybody else just politely leaves in single file. Yet another defoliator landed. I think I've had four of those by now. Anyway, I started bombing it and then realized I needed to make the kill box entrance slightly differently, as longer ranged enemies would just sit far back in the tunnel here and only be targetable by one or two bunkers, which isn't ideal. Note how I said I realized I needed to do this, not that I did this. It took a really long time to actually make that change. I decided to give Bucky a break from researching and let him sit in the scanner for a while, finding some decent materials that I'd be able to mine reliably and safely. I was mainly after plasteel, as I hadn't found any of it in the mountain so far, and it was holding back progress a bit, since you need it to make basically all the factory stuff as well as for advanced components. Another dodgy insect event happened here with an infested module that I just kind of left alone, but later on, when it took some fire accidentally, nothing came of it anyway. So, yeah, something to keep in mind if you play an insectless game with mods. You might get some weird stuff. I had the defences at what I figured would likely be close to their final form at this point, when a group of manhunting rhinos came in and barged directly through a gang of refugee children like a hungry grizzly bear barrels through a herd of newborn musk oxen. After which they slid their way through the entry maze and got gunned down. A couple more raids came as well, Randy was just really bloodthirsty with this colony for some reason. Nothing but raids and mech clusters this whole game so far. But anyway, yeah, these kingdom people showed up and had a go, which didn't go well, as you can hopefully imagine by now. And at this point, we're closing in on 200 days since landing. And this is when I had the incredible idea that maybe when the colony does reach 200 days, I could switch the storyteller to Winston Wave and see how far the dwarf fortress can make it. Because yeah, that seems like a great idea. I can even already see the video title. Building a fortress to survive Winston Wave in 200 days in RimWorld Biotech with Combat Extended, because you've got to hit those keywords. But for numerous reasons, it was actually a terrible idea. Ever since my original Waves video, I've really wanted to revisit Winston with a more overpowered setup to see how far it can really go. The problem is, it turns out that not very long after the wave I got to back in that video, which was 25, the game kind of reaches its limit when it comes to computation. Pretty much every raid is a 3 FPS slog fest, and the time between them is spent trying to clean all the corpses and stuff up to maintain a frame rate above 30. Every in-game day takes far longer than it should, and it's just not very fun. So yeah, anyway, it's not day 200 yet, so for now, the dwarves celebrated with their ritual of burial, which sounds like a funeral, but isn't. And for their jubilation, they're rewarded with Patel, another kind of just general dwarf who'll just end up helping out with a bit of everything like pretty much everybody else in this colony. While we had a trader from the Rosen people sitting in the middle of the kill box, a group of Itakin raided and, as you might expect, they got caught up in the crossfire. And that's probably far too old a reference for the majority of the audience, but you get the point. They got shot up and they were kind of annoyed by it. But I'm not too sad about that, since they're a low-tech faction anyway. They rarely have anything meaningful for sale. So after another siege, another weird passive infestation, and preparing a nice area for corpse and trash disposal, I got ready to switch the storyteller over to Winston. And this is another one of those moments where I'm glad I don't record my video colonies on commitment mode. I do it because I always end up needing to record random bits from various points in the colony's development. But in this case it also gave me a point I could come back to if the whole Winston thing turned out to be a bust. Which, as I implied earlier, it did but we'll still talk about it. I switched to Winston on day 202, with the raid interval set to exactly one day, which is just slightly faster than usual. And I turned breaching raids off because that'd just end very predictably, and I just wanted a power trip here, not an actual challenge. Don't judge me. 
I blew through the first few waves, sending them in quick succession, and not really getting any notable rewards. I was never taking colonist rewards because I figured they'd get really annoyed about being in a mountain surrounded by little angry dwarves, and my moral guide has level 3 social, so conversion would take roughly one human lifespan. Wave 12 arrived right into a combat supplier and a group of thrombos, and in the aftermath of that I got to scoop up some free cataphract armor, which I put Trudy in since it increases how much she can carry. And I did actually take a dwarf prisoner too. I intended to use them as a second researcher, but don't get too attached because remember this is all just a dream that didn't really happen. A great many sieges got bombarded by my big green 150mm death. During wave 18 there was a constant orbital bombardment which destroyed a load of my generators, but thankfully I had just made this thing beforehand, which could supply more than enough power for the colony all by itself. Wave 19 was interesting because it was a load of war caskets, which was scary but they were dealt with in any case. Then wave 21 demonstrated a part of the problem here. Just look at all this crap. After trying to figure out a reasonable way to deal with all of this, I just resorted to clearing most of it up with dev mode, which felt really dumb. Now here's this. Something is breaking all these raiders. They're just standing around and the game is running at, well, anywhere between 10 and 20 FPS, but the TPS is even lower, which is very unusual. Eventually, Chef landed a shell in the crowd, but it had no effect. So I just reloaded the last autosave and that sorted them out, and here they come. But at this point I was beginning to realise this wasn't going to work, and even if I did persevere, is it really a compelling video? Regardless, for some reason I actually did struggle through until wave 35, by which point the map looked like this, thanks to a glitched endless meteor shower. Ah! Oh, phew, it was just a dream. It's day 206 and the storyteller is Randy set to blood and dust. That nuclear reactor sure was a good idea though, so let's set that up. Now, if we're not doing Winston Wave anymore, how are we going to end this? Well, you'll have to wait and see in part two of this story. Make sure you're subscribed and hit that bell with a 155mm HE shell so you don't miss it. Yeah, sorry. I'd have rather kept this to a single video, but with the whole waves thing it made more sense to do it this way. I'm sure some of you actually prefer multi-part series, but I'd rather not make a habit of it. Before I close out, I actually made a Patreon. I don't want to make a big deal or shout about it in the middle of videos, and I never intend to do any patron callouts or anything annoying like that, but for some reason when somebody asked me if I'd ever do a Patreon I replied maybe at 10k, and here we are, so here I am. Like I said earlier when I was talking about dwarf sex, it feels like if I keep this up I could actually do it full time and quit my job, so this is just a way for you to help me to that goal if you're able and willing. I'll probably just drop a bi-weekly post there for patrons about what I'm up to and have a little section of the discord. Nothing super interesting, just the bare minimum. I expect nothing from you, but will accept almost anything you'll give. In any case, remain indoors. Sometimes the outside looks like this, which sucks. As always, thanks for watching, and until next time, goodbye.